Tuesday we will review 7-1 through 7-5, and Thursday you'll take the exam too. It's been so fast. After today, we're a third of the way through the semester. Part of me feels like we just started. But then when I read, when I look at that fact, it's like, oh no, we haven't just started. We're a third of the way through. Wow. All right, so does anyone have specific questions from homework that they want to look at? It's Thursday. Usually on Tuesday there's more questions because there's a little bit more space between Thursday and Tuesday. Um, so I grabbed just a couple of these from 7.3, so let's go through those and just do a little bit of practice with identities. The only way you're going to get competent at identities is to do them. There's no other way. And they're not things that you typically can just figure out on the fly. You just have to practice and learn some techniques and try different things. So um, I definitely encourage you to try to do lots of them. And one thing I talked about last time was that, I mean, in this, in this book and in all these books where they say verify the identity, they're not trying to trick you. They are identities. The instructions would say if it's not an identity, then you might be in a situation where you have an equation that's not really an identity. But no one's going to trick you. We're not, no one's trying to trick you. So on the test, when it says verify this identity, don't conclude that it's not an identity. All right. So here, we know it's an identity. We're just trying to prove it. And uh, the technique that we've used is to start with the more complicated side and try to manipulate it into the other side. So we'll go with the left side. I really would love you to do it exactly like this. You know, pick a side, make it clear what side you're picking, and then just move through until you get to the other side. And oh, I think it's, I shouldn't say it's obvious, but there's a couple of semi-obvious things to do. The right side doesn't have any tangents or cotangents in it, so it doesn't seem unreasonable to turn everything into sines and cosines. That's a reasonable thing to do. We could also send the tangent across and distribute it and then see what that does. There's lots of ways to go. Most of the time we're more comfortable working with sines and cosines instead of tangents and cotangents, so let's just change the sines and cosines. That's rarely a bad thing. And so let's just do that and see what happens. So I'll convert everything over to sine and cosine. And then cotangent is cosine over sine. And we have a fraction in there. So we could try to Combine like we have the same question here. Should we combine these guys by getting a common denominator, or now does it make more sense to send this fraction across? We kind of see that oh, there's going to be some cancellation right there, and that might not have been as obvious up here. Maybe it was to you. Which it, we want to get to the point where we see a function multiplied by its reciprocal gives one. That's what you want to get to. But sometimes when you're not dealing with sines and cosines, it's not as obvious. But right here, it's like, oh, OK, so if I distribute sine over cosine to cosine over sine, I'm going to get 1. So let's do that distribution now. So we're going to send this fraction to the first fraction, and we'll end up with sine squared of theta over cosine squared of theta. And then we're going to multiply it over there, and we get sine times cosine over sine times cosine, which is just 1. That's tangent squared plus 1. And that's what we would have got if we would have distributed up there. And that's how these identities work. You're going to try something. Maybe you go back and you realize, oh, if I did it again, I would skip this step and just go straight to there. You know, just That's how these go. So now, this is a Pythagorean identity. It's not the primary one. Our primary one, recall, is sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. That's our primary Pythagorean identity. There is a Pythagorean identity that involves tangent squared. How would we get a tangent squared here from this one? 
what would we divide all three terms by to get a tangent squared? <laughs> divide by cosine squared. Right. If we divide by cosine squared, that's going to give us our Pythagorean identity that involves tangent. So we see that it's tangent squared of theta plus 1 is equal to secant squared of theta. And there we have it. That is the right-hand side. So that Pythagorean identity is the key to this whole verification. Tan squared plus 1. And remember, I'll just draw the picture over here on the board of this identity. If you have a unit circle, this identity can be visualized by extending your terminal ray beyond the unit circle. And if you do that, then this is tangent. This is the radius of the circle, so that's 1. And the hypotenuse of that right triangle is secant of theta. So that's the, the visualization for that identity. And if you can remember that triangle, it's easy to remember the identity, tan squared plus 1 is secant squared. All right, let's try a second one. So this one, the left side is certainly more complicated, so let's go with that. Start on the left-hand side. And I think my inclination would be to get a common denominator and combine those fractions. The right-hand side has a single term. The left-hand side has two terms, so if we want to get to a single term, we want to somehow combine those fractions. And can someone tell us what that common denominator would be? One minus sine squared. One minus sine squared. Does everybody agree? One minus sine squared. So these denominators, we would call those relatively prime. Right? They're not, they're, it's, it's like if the denominators were 3 and 5. What's the common denominator if you had a 3 and a 5? 15, you just multiply them together. So if your denominators are relatively prime, you multiply them together. 1 minus sine times 1 plus sine is 1 minus sine squared. Right, exactly. So we would need to multiply the one on the left here by 1 plus sine over 1 plus sine. And the one on the right, we're going to multiply top and bottom by 1 minus sine. We're going to multiply by 1 minus sine over 1 minus sine. We can squeeze it in. And that the denominators are now the same. So we have 1 minus sine times 1 plus sine, 1 minus sine times 1 plus sine. So we can combine those into a single denominator. And that's 1 minus sine squared. Let's write it that way. And in the numerator, on the left, we have a 1 plus sine times a 1 plus sine. So that's 1 plus sine squared. Let's, let's FOIL it out, because we're going to definitely have to combine it with this other numerator over here. So let's FOIL that out. That'll be 1 plus 2 sine of x plus sine squared of x. OK, now the other one, when we FOIL that out, we have to be a little careful because the order is a little different. You know, the sine is first in this little numerator and second in that numerator. We just have to be careful. So we'll do first, outer, inner, last. Sine times 1 is sine. Outer is sine times sine. And there's a minus, so that's minus sine squared. Uh, inner is negative 1, and last is plus sign. So that's going to get, I'm going to put a 2 right there instead. So it, if we reordered it, it might be a little bit more obvious how to jump straight to the answer. You could rewrite this if you wanted to. You could rewrite, this one's probably easier to, nah, they're both kind of complicated to rewrite. But anyway, if you just FOIL, you'll get it. Oil. And let's see. We have some cancellation. We have sine squared there. And we have negative sine squared there. We have a, a 1. Let's use blue to wipe that 1 out. There's a plus 1 and a minus 1. 
So those go away. And it looks like our numerator ends up being 4 sine x. And then in the denominator, before I do anything with that denominator, let's just take a look at the right side and see what we're trying to target. Hmm. OK, a secant and a tangent. All right. What are the denominator? What's the denominator for secant? If you wrote it in terms of sines and cosines. 1 over cosine is secant. So we think of a cosine in the denominator. And what about for tangent? What's the denominator in tangent? The denominator. So if we write tangent as sines and cosines, we, what tangent is? Sine over cosine, so cosine's in the denominator. So both of those have a cosine in the denominator. And right here we have sines in the denominator. But what can we do with 1 minus sine squared? Cosine. Right, it is cosine squared, exactly. So our primary Pythagorean identity, remember, we need to get comfortable with just sort of rearranging it. And if you were to subtract off uh, and make it look like this. So if I subtracted out the sine squared, I'd have 1 minus sine squared on the left, cosine squared on the right. So that's what we're going to do. That will introduce cosines into the denominator. And then we can just sort of regroup them. And did we have a 4 in front of there? Yeah, oh good. <laughs> I was like, wait. So sine x over cosine x. I'm just going to regroup the denominator so that it looks like that. And then sine over cosine is tangent, 1 over cosine is secant. And so that gives it to us. So that's 4. And the way I've written it, it's 4 tangent secant. And you can, of course, reorder it if you want to make it look exactly the same. Commutative law of multiplication. You can switch the tan and the secant if you wanted to. Any questions on any steps there? So again, these things are just kind of trial and error. Just sort of do stuff. Just start working. All right, so you're talking about going from this step to this step, right? Yeah. So the LCD, the least common denominator, is the product of 1 minus sine times 1 plus sine. And if we FOIL out 1 minus sine times 1 plus sine, so there's 1 minus sine, there's 1 plus sine. If you FOIL that, first is 1, outer is plus sine, inner is minus sine, so the inner and the outer cancel. And then minus sine times sine is sine squared. Okay. Right? So, so it's, uh, um, that comes out as a consequence of a difference of squares. The inner and the outer will eat each other up. All right. Let's go to the other topic that we were talking about. And this looks like awfully wiggly highlighters. Um, and last class, this is what we kind of focused on. We had our three primary inverse trig functions. And remember that when you see an inverse trig function, the first thing in your mind is angle. And then you have to ask yourself, is the angle on the top of the circle or the right of the circle? And here's the summary. <coughs> inverse cosine is on the top. Inverse sine is on the right. And inverse tangent is on the right. So we have to just get that in our mind. And the one thing we notice that's different, both these are on the right. <coughs> but inverse tangent is not going to include those two endpoints. So those two are excluded which is why we have less than, or less than here and less than or equal to there. And that's because tangent of pi over 2 and tangent of minus pi over 2 are undefined. So let's do a couple practices here. So what we should say to ourselves when we see number 15 here, we should say angle on the right with a sine value of minus 1 half. And you know, you will know that you are prepared for this topic on the test when you don't have to write anything down except the answer. So you'll know you're ready for the test with these, invert, with these basic inverse evaluations when you can just sort of see it in your head, oh yeah, that's negative one half, or whatever it is. 
um, or whatever the angle is, a negative pi over 6 here. You know, so you can sort of visualize, okay, it's on the right side of the circle, and would we use a 12 sector or an 8 sector circle for that one? 12 sector circle, it's a multiple of, it's going to be a multiple of 30 degrees or pi over 6 radians. <clears throat> also notice here that <coughs> we know that we're going to come up with an angle. Inverse trig functions are angles. If it doesn't say radians or degrees, you know, either one is acceptable. If it doesn't say, find the answer in radians. Or if it doesn't say, find the answer in degrees. It doesn't matter which one if it doesn't tell you what to do. So we're on the right with a, <coughs> a sine value of negative 1 half. So that's right there. And that angle is negative pi over 6. <coughs> if it's not crystal clear when you're visualizing it, draw a picture. It's a really helpful thing to do. Inverse cosine, <coughs> that is an angle. And that angle's on the top. <coughs> so we say angle on top with a cosine value of negative root 2 over 2. Well, angle on top, cosine value of negative root 2 over 2, that's going to put us here. And what angle is that in radians? Yeah, 3 pi over 4. And then this last one, inverse secant. There's two ways to do it. Uh, let's, let's do it the constructive way. Let's just go and do it the way we did these two. Instead of using, there's an identity that we could do, but let's first just do it using the constructive way. <coughs> so we would say inverse cosine is an angle on top. Inverse cosine and inverse secant both are on top. Inverse sine and inverse cosecant are both on the right. But then the tangent and cotangent are, are split. Inverse tangents on the right, but inverse cotangents on top. So this one's on top, and this just says what angle on top has a secant value of 2. <coughs> the angle on top that has a secant value of 2 is the same as the angle on top with a cosine value of 1 half. And that plops us right there, where the cosine value is 1 half. Any questions on why it's right there? So that is our angle. That's pi over 3. So that's how we would do it. Constructively, we would sort of say, oh, inverse secant's on top, and we're just constructing what the answer is. If we wanted to use an identity, we would say this is equal to the inverse cosine of the reciprocal. And that's essentially what we did say to ourselves. You know? This, when we use the identity, this is just converting it from inverse secant to inverse cosine, and then we're asking ourselves the same question. What's the angle on top of the cosine of 1 half? Five or three. <clears throat> any question on any of those or this concept in general? Inverse trig functions are angles. That's what we need to do. All right, so you guys try that one. Try the top two. Top two. Top two. Think about what the tangent values are where you have the steep terminal ray and the less steep terminal ray. That's where the root 3's came from. 
If you're on the eight sector circle, the tangents of those intermediate points are plus or minus one. So it can't be an eight sector circle. Top or right? Inverse tangent. Right hand side. So we're saying, what's the angle on the right that has a tangent value of root 3? You should immediately be jumping up to quadrant 1, because right, that's where tangents are positive. Tangents would be negative down here. And then we just have to remember, you can either remember that root 3 is the steeper terminal ray, and root 3 over 3 is the less steep terminal ray. That's how I think of it. And if you don't remember that, then just think about your coordinates. Put your coordinates in. So this point right here, it's 1 half comma root 3 over 2. And the tangent then is root 3 over 2 divided by 1 half, which means multiplied by 2. And we get the root 3. So if it's not 100% clear, put in your coordinates and check. You know that tangent is y over x, so you can check that really quickly. OK, so what is that angle then? Pi over 3, exactly. And then over here, 12 sector circle, because we see a root 3 over 2. Anytime you see a root 3 over 2, you know it's going to be a 12. And so that's saying angle on what? Top or right? Right side. It's negative in there, so we know we're going to be down in quadrant 4. So we're going to say to ourselves, angle on the right with a sign of negative root 3 over 2. That means the y coordinate is negative root 3 over 2. That's the longer leg in the 12 sector circle. So there's our angle minus pi over 3. And just keep in mind, it is not the same to say that that is the angle. Not. So that is not the angle. Right. It has to stay in the right hand side when you draw your little angle arc. All right. Two more. All right, see if you can get those two. Those are a little bit more complicated. Top or right for inverse secant? Top for inverse secant. And how about inverse cosecant? Right. So those two are the easy ones because they're directly related to their reciprocal functions. If we think about cosine and secant, they're both on top, and uh, sine and cosecant, the inverses, are both on the right. OK, so that's saying the angle on top with a secant value of root 2, which is the same thing as the angle on top with a cosine value of 1 over root 2. And 1 over root 2 is root 2 over 2. So we want the angle on the top with a cosine value of root 2 over 2, and it's got to be right there. Pi over 4. Second one here, this says the angle on the right with a cosecant value of negative 1. That's the same thing as the angle on the right with a sine value of negative 1, because the reciprocal of negative 1 is negative 1. And that's right down here. That's where the sine value is negative 1. So that's minus pi over 2. All right, 
Any questions? Yeah? I'm confused as to whether which, um, are we supposed to use the x value for, for uh, cosine and the y value for sine? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep, so when we look at a general unit circle, the what we're thinking in our minds is we have some random angle. The coordinates are cosine theta, sine theta, if we're on a unit circle. And that theta, it could be this counterclockwise rotation. It could be this clockwise rotation. It doesn't matter. If that's the terminal ray, then no matter what, the coordinates of that point are cosine for x, sine for y. So x is always associated with cosine, y is always associated with uh, sine. All right. Let's look at a little more of these compositions. We did three of them at the end of class yesterday, or yeah, maybe just two, or Tuesday. So let's look at these a little more carefully. And what I want to do first is focus on these situations where We've got a function and its inverse that are being composed. So let's look at those two situations. And we are really good now at realizing that inverse sine is an angle on the right. Okay. If this angle on the inside is an angle on the right, then we just erase the function and its inverse. If do you agree that pi over 5 is on the right? So we know that to be on the right, and we're up in quadrant 1, pi over 2 is on top. And so we just have to sort of figure out, is pi over 5 up there, or is it possibly over in quadrant 2? So if we took the entire arc up here, that's pi. So if we separate it into five pieces, pi over 5 would actually be over there in quadrant 1. So yeah. You could also convert it to degrees if you weren't 100% sure, if you can't visualize that well. How would we convert pi over 5 to degrees? Multiply by 180 over pi. And that goes in there 3 times and then 6, so 36 degrees. Definitely in quadrant 1. So if that angle's on the right, we can just erase the function and its inverse. This one, inverse cosine of cosine. We know inverse cosine is angle on top. If that angle on the inside is an angle on top, we just erase. Pi over 7 is definitely an angle on top, so we just erase. All right. Now, when the two functions being composed don't match, if it's not a function and it's inverse, then we simply bootstrap our way through. Start on the inside, solve, move a step out, solve. So here, we're going to go inside, and we're going to say, what is the cosine of pi over 6? And what is that? Root 3 over 2. That's the long leg on the 12. And we just answer each question as we go. So now we're answering the question, what's inverse sine of root 3 over 2? So we're saying, what's the angle on the right with the sine value of root 3 over 2? And the angle on the right with the sine value of root 3 over 2 is pi over 3. Mm -hmm. OK. So right here, it sort of looks, you know, I've, I've given you some insight into when you can just erase these and when you can't. Uh, you certainly can't always erase them. So when the inverse function is on the outside, it doesn't always cancel. If we look at this one here, inverse sine is on the outside, and that is an angle on what part of the circle? The right side. 
Is 5 pi over 6 on the right side of the circle? No. 5 pi over 6 over here in quadrant 2. Here it will not erase. So we go to the inside and just work our way out. So we say, OK, well, what is the sine of 5 pi over 6? We're on a 12 sector circle over at 5 pi over 6. Sine is the y value. That's the small leg, the short leg. So that's 1 half. <sighs> And now we answer the inverse question. Angle on the right with the sine value of 1 half. Pi over 6. Angle on the right with a sine value of 1 half. So the y value is 1 half. The y value is the short leg on the 12 sector. So we're up at pi over 6. Now you certainly should be observing there is some symmetry going on here. We know that inverse sine has got to be over here, and the angle that we started with, 5 pi over 6, is here. And if we jump across, this is where we ended up right? as our final answer was pi over 6. And that kind of symmetry will always be present. OK, this one. We know inverse cosines on top. 7 pi over 6, what quadrant is that in? 3, so that's not on top. 7 pi over 6 is? just beyond pi. So definitely, we can't just erase. But we evaluate. Start on the inside. Cosine of 7 pi over 6. So we're in quadrant 3, 7 pi over 6 on the 12 sector circle. Cosine's x. That's the longer leg. So we get negative root 3 over 2. And then what's that? 5 pi over 6. That is if we just take a, a quick peek at the symmetry here, you know, we know that inverse cosine's got to be on top. The angle that we started with was down here. But then the angle that we finished up with was right there. We use that symmetry to get us into the proper range. All right. You look ready for a harder one. Oh, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. We'll get there. <coughs> These ones notice the difference. We still have a function and its inverse. Right? Function and its inverse. The difference is the inverse trig functions on the inside, the trig functions on the outside. With these, the freshman dream always works. These just cancel. That will always just work. You know, if you gave that problem to probably to any high school math student, that's what they would do, right? You would just do that. That's what you think would be the answer. And it's true. Here it is. If the inverse trig functions on the inside and the trig functions on the outside, it will always do that. You'll always be able to cancel it. Why? Well, when the inverse trig functions on the outside, that's where we have the restriction. The outside function dictates what the answer is. Like the outside function, if it's an inverse trig function, tells us the angle has to be on the right or it has to be on the top. That's not true here. The sine is a, ra is a trig function. We're going to find um, we're going to find a ratio, and it doesn't matter, right? If we figure out the angle here, the inverse sine of negative 1 half, let's evaluate it. Let's come down here and just suppose we didn't know this general principle. We would so say, what's the angle on the right with a sine value of negative 1 half? And you would say negative pi over 6. And then you would say, well, what's the sine of negative pi over 6? And you would say negative 1 half. So you can absolutely just evaluate these if you're not 100% comfortable with the general principle. Here, inverse cosine of negative 1. Angle on top with a cosine of negative 1 is pi. And then cosine of pi is negative 1. So if the inverse trig function is on the inside and its inverse is on the outside, they just eliminate each other. They undo each other. So. All right. But again, if you're not comfortable with the general principle, just start on the inside and work your way out. That always works. All right, here are the more complicated ones. 
All right. So we can't use a more general principle here. The two functions that we are composing are not inverses of each other. So we can't, there's no general principle we can use here. Side note though, so if this was sine of inverse sine of a over 3, what would the answer be? a over 3, exactly. So if those matched and the inverse was on the inside, general principle would allow us to just jump right to the answer. All right, so here, hmm, doesn't work. Let's draw a general four sector circle. And let's identify the angle. The angle is an inverse tangent, so that's on the right. <coughs> and inverse tan is on the right. OK, so we could pick a terminal ray in either quadrant one or four. It does not matter. Let's pick right there. Doesn't matter. You could just as easily write it up in quadrant one. And what we're trying to do is draw a picture that represents this angle. I'll call that angle alpha. So I'm going to just think of that as angle alpha. Inverse tangent of a over 3 is the angle on the right with a tangent value of a over 3. If the tangent value of that angle is a over 3, what's the natural, what's the natural set of coordinates? 3a, right? So we're going to agree with that, that if, if we're dealing with an angle and you're told the tangent value is a over 3, and we know that tangent is y divided by x, let's pick y is a and x is 3. That would work. We don't know r, though. This is not a unit circle, necessarily. We will see that it's not. So we have to calculate r. 3 squared a squared. Solve for r. Don't need the minus because we're dealing with the distance, so there's r. And now we're good to go. The question said, what is the sine of this angle? Well, the sine of an angle is the y value divided by the r value. We have both of those now. So our answer is a divided by the square root of 9 plus a squared. Don't you forget the exponent on the 9? Should there be, should it be squared? Uh, the 3 was squared. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I, so we could rewrite this. Yeah, I, I skipped that step. So that's 3 squared there. So we're taking the square of the x term, the square of the y term, adding them together, and then taking the square root. All right, so there's our expression. Yeah? So if it's a square root of 9 plus a squared, uh -huh. those are perfect squares, why can't it just be a over 3 plus a? Somebody? Anyone want to answer that? Plus or minus? Is that like? Nope. Oh. This is one of those things. So tell me this. What is the square root of 4 times x squared? If we assume that x is greater than or equal to 0. What's that? 2x. 2x. Here, where the operation connecting the two is multiplication, you can do that. But let's suppose we have this. If we have 4 plus 9, What's the square root of that? Square root of 13, right? Square root of 13? It's not equal to the square, it's not equal to 2 plus 3. Right? Not equal to 5. Everyone agree? Yeah, that's one of those ones you really, and it takes. You gotta bang your head against the wall a few times before you really get that sunk in. So the square root can be, if you will, distributed down if you have factors, but it can't be distributed down if you have terms. So you can't distribute that square root across a plus or a minus. Good question. It's really important to get that down. It's a super common error to make. Um, 
But what helps a lot, you know, when you're looking there and you see the variable and you're sort of thinking that, it really helps to look at a numerical example. If you're not 100% sure, check a numerical example. All right, this guy over here, same kind of idea. We don't have a general principle that applies here. No general principle. And let me just write over here. I'm going to call this sine of alpha on the left just to make sure that it's we're good. finishing that off. Okay. I, I have a yeah, go for it. Um, how do we get the A on top, right there on the bottom, from the sine of alpha? A over 9? Yeah. Right here? Yeah. Sine of an angle is the y coordinate divided by the radius. So sine of this angle would be the y coordinate of the terminal point, which is A, divided by the radius that gets you to the terminal point, and we calculated the radius to be root of the, make sense? Yeah, good. Yeah. All right, next one. Still, a, we, still on the right-hand side of the circle, inverse sine. Let's draw our terminal ray right here this time. Again, it doesn't matter. So, I will choose not to use a unit circle because we're looking for, if we call this angle alpha, we are looking for an angle on the right that has a sine value of p over q. So what are we going to do with the three options here. If the sine value of this angle is p over q, where should I put the p, where should I put the q? <coughs> what should go in the x-coordinate? Unknown. <laughs> what should go in the y-coordinate? P. What should go in the hypotenuse? Q. Yeah. Right? Sine is y over r. So the sine value of that angle is PQ, P over Q. And we don't know what X is, so we find it. We know that X squared plus P squared is the radius squared. I'm trying to solve for X here. So X will be, hmm, do I need to put a plus or minus with the square root? No. So no matter where I drew the terminal ray, whether I drew it in quadrant 1 or quadrant 4, the x values here are all non-negative. So we can choose the positive square root. Now we're super close. So the cotangent of what I call the alpha, call that alpha, cotangent of alpha is equal to, hmm, we're at a terminal point. On a circle, cotangent is x over y. So we go up here. Oh, there's x. We just solve for it. There's x divided by y, which is p. <coughs> that would be it. one is combining, these two are combining the identities that we just worked with a couple days ago, a couple sessions ago. Let's write, let me write it just above. What is sine, what did we calculate sine of 2 theta to be? Remember? Close, sine theta cosine theta times 2. It was 2 sine theta cosine theta. And remember that if we wanted to do it from scratch, if you didn't remember, you could do sine of theta plus theta. And that would, that would work. You could do the sine of a sum with theta plus theta. All right. That's what we have here. Right? That's 2 theta. Where theta is this, this is an angle. That's an angle. 
Inverse trig functions are angles. So that's an angle. So we have sine of 2 theta right there before our very eyes. So we are going to write this as 2 times sine of theta times cosine of theta. Let's take a look at the angle inverse cosine of 3 fifths. Inverse cosine of 3 fifths is an angle on top with a cosine value of 3 fifths. So let's just label that terminal point. If the cosine value is 3 fifths, do you agree with this. That angle that I just drew on the right side of the circle has a cosine value of 3 fifths. Cosine is x over r. Let's figure out what y it must be. So we square, square, square. So we're going to have 3 squared plus y squared equals 5 squared. We need to solve that for y. So y squared is 25 minus 9, which is 16. So y is plus or minus 4, but we can choose positive 4 because we're in the top half of the circle. Okay. So y is 4. So now we can answer the question. Right here, we have 2 times sine of inverse cosine of 3 fifths. Sine is the y coordinate divided by the radius, so that's 4 fifths. And what's cosine of inverse cosine? Yeah. They just collapse. The dream, when the functions are inverses of each other and the inverse trig functions on the inside, they just undo each other. So times 3 fifths. So our final answer is 12 times 2, which is 24 over 25. That'll be our that'll be our final answer. Hmm. All right. You guys try this one. That is cosine of alpha minus beta. This is cosine of a difference. Think of that as alpha. Think of that as beta. Let's see if you can piece that together. Cosine of alpha minus beta. Cosine of a difference. Those formulas hopefully are at your fingertips, at your mental fingertips. write down the first line here, because if you can't get the first line, then you're in deep trouble. 
So it's always cosine of the first angle. So it's cosine of inverse sine of x. So that's cosine of alpha. That's cosine of the first angle. And then what is the second factor of the first term? Cosine of beta. So it's going to be cosine of inverse cosine of y. Mm -hmm. And then we have to do the plus or minus thing. And plus or minus. Plus, cosine is opposite. And then we did cosine, cosine, so we're missing sine, sine. So we're going to do sine of inverse sine of x multiplied by sine of inverse cosine of y. <coughs> Let's do one simple uh, simplification first. What does that turn into? Y, exactly. So let's just do that. So we'll focus on this other piece in one second. So that's times Y. And how about that one? X. X, yeah, good. And we'll focus on this one now. OK. So with that first one, cosine of inverse sine of X, there's no general principle. Got it? Sine of inverse cosine. Because it's cosine, so it'd be cosine, cosine, sine. Yes. Yep, that's what we have. Cosine, cosine, sine, sine. Yeah, that's right. It's just maybe a little squeezed in up there. But you're right. Cosine, cosine, sine, sine. And with this evaluation here, we don't have a general principle, so we have to go and draw a picture. The picture here will work great. <clears throat> so this angle, inverse sine of x, that's an angle on what side of the circle? Yeah, it's this angle on the right with a sine value of, sine value of x, it doesn't matter where we draw it. If the sine value is x, <coughs> we have that. Right? <coughs> if the sine value is x, that means the y-coordinate divided by the radius is x. So it means we're putting an x in the y position. Here it's very helpful to have colored markers. So, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this here. I'm going to just try to distinguish that x slightly differently. We don't know what that x value is, though. We know that the y value is x, but we don't know what the x value is. So we use the Pythagorean theorem. We're going to do x the green x squared plus the little x squared. That has to equal 1 squared, which is 1. We're trying to solve for that big green x. That's going to be the square root of 1 minus the little x squared. So that would, that's what goes in the first position there. So now we can answer the question. Cosine of inverse sine of x is that position right there, divided by 1. So it's just square root of 1 minus x squared. And then we have to times it by y. So I'm going to put that y in front so it doesn't look like it's inside the square root. Like that. Plus x times, move all that just a smidge to the right. And then we can do the other one. So now we have to do inverse cosine of y. No general principle here. Sine of inverse cosine, those inverses don't match. So we can't use a general principle. So we draw a picture. So we're going to draw a nice picture. Inverse cosine. Top half. Top half of the circle. We want an angle on top with a cosine of y. Cosine value of y, angle on top. Doesn't matter where you draw it, just draw it there. But we do have to have the fact that the cosine value is y. So the cosine value being y means 
this. That is an angle with a cosine value of y. And here we don't know the y coordinate, so let's put a big y there. Pythagorean theorem, little y squared plus big y squared is going to be 1. <coughs> big y squared is going to be 1 minus y, little y squared. Cap y is square root. Don't need the minus because y's are positive up top, or at least not negative. Sine of this angle, capital Y over 1, so just capital Y. That will be our final answer. Okay. Hmm. Curiously interesting. Any step there that? Yeah. One. So we used one. Notice the difference with this previous slide over here. Inside we had a fraction, so we had to use. Uh, actually, let's focus on this one. Over here we had a fraction, and we had to figure out an angle that had a sine value of p over q. So there we had the sort of the natural thing to do is to choose a radius of q. But on the one we're dealing with, we have a fraction where the denominator is 1, right? We can think of that as over 1 if we want. So this is saying the angle with a sine value of 1. So we need this y position divided by the radius to be x. So we, we get to choose the radius to be 1 because we're just looking for a sine value of x. So we can choose x over 1. Good question. Yeah? So since we're doing like the inverse of cosine y mm -hmm. on the outside is sine. Yeah. Wow. So once we got the cosine of the inverse of y, what happens to the sine on the outside? The, right here? Yeah. OK. So we're evaluating. So we're evaluating this whole expression. So this expression right here means find the y-coordinate of the terminal point on the unit circle. So that's what that means, right? Sine of an angle is the y coordinate on the terminal point on a unit circle. So when we come down here, we've drawn a picture for the angle. So that is the angle right there. Right? That is inverse cosine of y. So that angle is right there. And the sine of that angle is this y value divided by the radius. The radius is 1. So the sine value is just that coordinate. And that coordinate is 1 minus y squared, square rooted. Mm -hmm. Are there questions that you have on any step? If these two are, are good summaries. If these two are feeling comfortable, that's a really good sign. I mean, these, are, these are hard questions. All right. Why don't, before we do the last section, let's take a break. It's a minute before 11, but that's OK. Take a 10 minute break, and then we'll do. All right. Every math class you've ever taken has a focus on solving equations. This math class is no different. We need to solve equations. The only difference is that we have equations that have trig functions in them. And trig functions are periodic, so that means we have an infinite number of solutions almost always. Which means you're going to be so busy writing down an infinite number of solutions. Uh, OK, so how do we do that? How do we write down an infinite number of solutions without really writing down an infinite number of solutions? That would take too long. Yes. We need to be able to count. All right, that's exactly right. We need to be able to count. So solve finding solutions in both radians and degrees. So here is my, so what we're going to first do is solve what I call basic equations. Trig function equals number. So there's no transformations. It's just quite simple in structure. Trig function, number. <clears throat> Go to the unit circle. 
figure out where you are in the unit circle. So our target sine of x is negative root 2 over 2. So sine is negative root 2 over 2 at those two positions on the unit circle. Everybody agree there's two quadrants. We are going to have a group of solutions in quadrant 3 and a group in quadrant 4. Because if this is a solution right there, so are 2 pi multiples. Ditto over here. If that is a solution, so are 2 pi multiples. So what we have to do is the following. We say that x will be equal to, this first one is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 pi over 4, plus 2 pi k. There's our counter. k is an integer. So k is going to count off all the solutions. Just like we use k to count the asymptotes, we're going to use k to count the solutions. So if k is 0, we're at 5 pi over 4. And if k is 1, we're at 5 pi over 4 plus 2 pi plus 1 revolution. If k is 2, we're at 5 pi over 4 plus 2 more revolutions. And right, if k is negative 1, we're going to be here and then subtract. So this will take care of all the positive and negative angles that have that as a terminal ray. Infinite number of them. k is an integer. It could be positive or negative. So that is the quadrant 3 solutions. Or we could be at 7 pi over 4 plus 2 pi k. So that's how we do it. That's how we get to all infinite solutions. And that's how we get to the solutions that are showing up in quadrant 3 and 4. And I refer to this angle here as a representative angle for that group in quadrant 3. And this is a representative angle for the group in quadrant 4. And that representative angle is between 0 and 2 pi. <coughs> It's not too crazy yet. Inver uh, excuse me, not inverse. Cosine of x equals negative 1 half. We have two places. Cosine is negative 1 half at those two. So again, we have two groups of solutions. And we're going to pick a representative angle for each group. So our angle x will be 1, 2, 3, 4, pi over 6, which is 2 pi over 3 plus 2 pi k. Or down here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 pi over 6, which is 4 pi over 3, plus 2 pi k. It asked us to do it both in radians and degrees. Um, let's, if we wanted to do this in degrees, maybe I'll just say the answer in degrees instead of writing it out also. So if we wanted to do this in degrees, how many degrees would that be to our representative angle in quadrant 3? 180 plus 45? 225. So we do 225 degrees plus 360 degrees times k. Maybe I will squeeze it in down there. So x is equal to 225 degrees plus 360k. Or that angle in degrees, 270 plus 45, 315, plus 360k. Over here, same idea. I'm not going to write it down for that one. Not enough space. Uh, let's, we will write it down for this one, though. All right. So this one, tangent is negative 1, two places. Now you're going to notice, I'm sure some of you already noticed, that hey, instead of doing two groups, because we have perfect symmetry here, we could actually just, instead of using a 2 pi counter, use a pi counter. Instead of going 2 pi back into quadrant 2, we could go, oh, let's count them by doing solution in quadrant 2, solution in quadrant 4, 2, 4, 2, 4. So we could do this. We could say that representative angle is all we need, 1, 2, 3 pi over 4, plus pi times k instead of 2 pi times k. And that will get all the quadrant 2 and quadrant 4 solutions. And if we write that one in degrees, we would say that's 135 degrees plus 180 times k. 
And that one tends to only work uh, it tend, for tangent and cotangent. That works almost every time. And there are other cases where we will be able to find a shortcut. You just have to look and make sure there's some perfect symmetry there. If you go either way from your answer, your next answer has to be the same distance. So that tends to be true for tangent and cotangent. Not always, but tends to be true for them. All right. Let's try these guys. So these are a little bit more complicated. They're basic trig equations because we have a trig function and a number. But secants and cosecants, recommendation, convert to sines and cosines. So this will be cosine of x equals minus 1 over root 2, which is minus root 2 over 2. So I would rewrite those so that you're dealing with sines and cosines. Dealing with sines and cosines is always easier. So let's rewrite this one as minus 3 over 2 root 3. And if you rationalize the denominator, you get minus root 3 over 2. If you multiply top and bottom by root 3. You'll end up with minus root 3 over 2. All right, so let's solve these two. Cosine x is negative root 2 over 2. So we'll choose an 8 sector circle. And we have to target, let's see, cosine negative. So that's quadrants 2 and 3. So those are our two angles that we're trying to target. Quadrant 2 and quadrant 3. So. There's our first angle, there's our second. So x will equal 1, 2, 3 pi over 4 plus 2 pi k or 5 pi over 4 plus 2 pi k. Draw a picture. That one, 12 sector circle. And what quadrants are we looking at here for that one? Three and four. So the sine value is negative, root three over two for both. So we're going to be down here where the y value is on the long leg. So we have to figure out our two representative solutions. We've got that one in quadrant four and that one in quadrant three. So our x will be, let's see. Uh, down in quadrant 3, what is that angle? 4 pi over 3 plus 2 pi k or 1 more pi over 3, so 5 pi over 3 plus 2 pi k. Alright, so that's how we solve our basic trig equations. We have a trig function equal a number, we figure out the quadrants, we find our representative angles, and then we add 2 pi k. We count. Count off our infinite solutions. So before we go on, any of those you want a summary of, or is there anything that's confusing? Very important to know your unit circles by now. Unit circle is, you don't know your unit circle, Trouble. Big trouble. All right. Here we have an equation. They also draw a picture for us here, so we see the graph. And we have, we don't just have a simple trig equation here. Maybe we can convert it to a basic equation. That's ideally what we can do, is convert it to a basic. Uh, we can see all the answers, right? The, they, the way they've graphed this, they've shown, us, they've shown us a graph of y equals 1 right there, and y equals the left-hand side is the tangent function. So the x-coordinates of each of those intersection points, those are the answers. Those are the solutions for that equation, the x values there. So we'll just treat it like a regular equation. We're going to add 4 to both sides. We'll divide both sides by 2. We have that. 
So do what we've always done. Isolate the variable term, and then it, with the trig equation, then we have to go to a unit circle and do our business. Hmm. All right. Now this one, that's no special ratio, right? Tangent 5 halves, not a special ratio. Here's how we're going to get at it. We do know the quadrants, though. What quadrants would we be in? One and three. One and three. So I'll draw that. I'm drawing, I'm, and as I draw that, I'm thinking I want a slope about two and a half. There's slope one. It's about two and a half. Good enough. So we have these two terminal points. For a tangent, we really just need this one. Right? That should be enough. We can find that. Find that right there. OK. Uh, maybe I won't call it alpha. Let's not call it alpha. Let's just leave it unlabeled for the moment. <coughs> OK. <coughs> when we have a non-special ratio, we're going to have to use our calculator. OK. This angle right here is a reference angle. That is a reference angle. So if we have a non-special ratio, we will use a reference angle. So here's how we find our reference angle. To find a reference angle, we do the inverse trig of the absolute value of the other side. And we usually call it, take the angle and put a prime on it to, to, rep, to uh, represent the reference angle. And when we're doing this here, when we have to use our calculator, we're going to do it in degrees. It's going to be a lot easier in degrees when I ask you on the test. They do have it in radians, so we'll just do it in radians here. But when you see it in degrees, it gives you a little bit of an indication on whether you're dealing, doing it correctly or not, because we're very comfortable with the geometry of degrees. So here, we'll do it in radians, because that's what they have. But it's going to look a little weird. So make sure your mode is radians. And we're going to do inverse tangent of 2.5. Inverse tangent 2.5. We get 1.19. We'll just go to two decimal places. So that's in radians. All right. Now, this process for this problem is nice because we're in quadrant one, and in quadrant one, the angle and the reference angle are identical. So we don't have to do anything, any extra work here. If this was tangent x equals negative 5 halves, it would be over here. And we'd be trying to find an angle in quadrant 2. And an angle in quadrant 2 would be found by doing what with the reference angle? If we were in quadrant 2. So if our terminal ray was right there, our reference angle would be right there. How would we find that angle if that was our reference angle? Subtract. subtract from 180 if we're in degrees. Subtract from pi if we're in radians. Yep, that's right. OK, let's get that off there, though. Because we're not in quadrant 2. We're in quadrant 1. So this allows us, then, to write our final answer. x equals 1.19 radians. They didn't tell us what to round to, so we'll just do this. 1.19 radians plus pi k. So pi k, because these are evenly spaced on the circle, so we can get away with one equation for our solution set, not two. So that would be our set of all solutions. Now sometimes you'll have this restriction. On the test, I will ask you for both. I will say find all solutions. And sometimes I'll say, also find the solutions that are in this interval. So if they ask that, here's how we're going to distinguish. So I'm going to just call this all, because we just found all solutions. And it's usually helpful to find all solutions before you find your restricted solutions. Now when we look at our picture, it tells us how many solutions should we have if we're going 0 to 2 pi. Yeah, just 2. So here we have to add pi to it. We let k be 1, and we'll get the next one. So we have a 3.14. So we're going to have 
that will be our next one. And if we added pi again, then we'd be beyond 2 pi. So if they say 0 to 2 pi, we'll get just those two answers. Okay. And on the test, I'll ask you both. So I think it's always easiest to get all first. And then you can start plugging in k's as you need. All right, let's jump over to here. So again, they've drawn a picture for us. So our goal with any of these trig equations, if we can turn it into a basic trig equation, then we know what to do. And if you saw that equation up there, you would notice, what would you say? What do you think the first step is? It begins with an F. Factor! Not free. <laughs> Factor! Factor out. And in college algebra, if you had an equation that was not linear, you dumped everything on one side of the equation and you factored it. Right? And then you set each factor to zero. They use this thing called the zero product rule. And that's what we're going to do with trig equations, too. So if we factor out that sign, we have this equation, and we, have this, and we can apply the zero product rule here. We can say, oh, the only way this is 0 is if sine of x is equal to 0, or 2 cosine x plus 1 is equal to 0, or in other words, cosine x is minus 1 over 2, minus a half. So we've taken the equation, we've converted it into a product of factors, we've applied the zero product rule, and the zero product rule has created two basic trig equations. And so that's why we need the basic trig equations down pat, because that's how you solve a more complicated equation. You're trying to turn it into a collection of basic trig equations. And then we'll, I will draw, I definitely recommend that you draw little circles to help you in your, in your uh, final, in writing your final answer. So, Sine of x is 0, there and there. Cosine of x is negative 1 half, there and there. Those are awfully big dots for those little circles. Oh, that almost looks like an insect. All right. So let's look at this one on the left. Those are evenly spaced, so we can actually get away with one line for our solution. What do you think it would be? Yeah, pi k. Pi k. If you go to this first representative solution, that's 0. And to get to the next one, you add or subtract pi. So it would be 0 plus pi k, which is just pi k. Yeah, good. Now this one, we definitely can't quite do that. So we're going to have to go, oh, that's 2 pi over 3 plus 2 pi k. Or there's 2 pi over 3, 3 pi over 3, 4 pi over 3 plus 2 pi k. All right, so this is the group of all solutions. So all solutions, right there. That's all of them. Now, if they say between 0 and 2 pi, we do this. So between 0 and 2 pi, certainly 0. Certainly pi, and if we want to do them in order, we could go, if we're really on top of it, if you're not, that's fine, do these two and then those two, but if you just kind of see the order, then that's 2 pi over 3, and then that's pi, and then that's 4 pi over 3. So those would be the solutions between 0 and 2 pi. Do you see why we don't put 2 pi on there? We have a parenthesis on the edge here, so we don't include 2 pi. Right? So we, that is 0. That's not 2 pi. 
Those would be our restricted solutions. Any questions on how we're generating these groups of answers? So, do you want to try that one? Can you factor with the trig function in there? Try that one. Try number 18. And you're going to use your standard algebra technique. It's not a linear equation, so everything goes to one side and then factor. So see if you can factor that. If you have to, just write down on your paper 2x squared plus 7x minus 4 and try to factor that. And so you're just treating sine like you would treat an x in college algebra. 2 sine squared plus 7 sine minus 4. No. Yeah, that's a really common pitfall. Yeah, we have to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, you've got to you've got to factor it like a quadratic. You know, unfoil it. Unfoil it. Unfoil the madness. So you've got to unfoil it. The right side has to be 0. If the right side is not 0, then you can't use the 0 product rule. If the whole premise is that you have a times b equals 0, which means a has to be 0 or b has to be 0. If you have the right side as 4, that's not going to help you. So you've got to have it separated like that. And if you just factor sine out of these first two, that's still, that's not going to get you anywhere. You, you want to have something times something equals zero, because then you can apply zero product rule. So we're going to treat it like we would a quadratic. We would say, okay, well, this has to be two sine of theta, and this has to be theta. Just like if we had it written with x's, you would have two x and x, so you get two sine squared. And then we have to go over to the last piece, and we have to say, all right, factors of 4. <clears throat> and let's put a 4 and a 1 like that. You can try, do a little trial and error. But you know the signs have to be different, because that's a minus and the inside's a plus. So the only way that can happen is if one's a plus and one's a minus. So if we do that, the outer is 8 sine theta. The inner is minus 1 sine theta. <clears throat> so outer plus inner will give us 7 sine theta here. So yeah, definitely you got to unfoil it. It's really tempting to factor sine out of those first two terms. But when you have a quadratic, that does not help you. You had, if you factored x out of that, so that you had x times 2x plus 7 minus 4 equals 0, right, that doesn't help. You know, that's the same thing as having the 4 on the right, and that doesn't help. Right? 
we have, <coughs> we can't say that x is equal to 4, right? There's no, we have to have the right side being 0, and we have to have the left side being a product. Now we can create two little basic trig equations. So this implies that sine of theta is 1 half, or sine of theta is negative 4. Let's look at the first one. Sine of theta is 1 half. 12 or 8? 12? Sine is 1 half there and there. So the solutions will be, all solutions will be pi over 6 plus 2 pi k or 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 pi over 6 plus 2 pi k. And I should say that that's x equals, I think if I just erase that I can do that. So x equals, that's our, or theta, dang it. There we go. All right, so that's from the first part. How about that second part? Sine of theta equals negative 4? How many angles have a sine value of negative 4? Is there any sine value, any angle that has a sine value of negative 4? Sine value is the y coordinate on the unit circle. The unit circle. Can the y value be negative 4? No. Y value cannot be negative 4. No solution is coming from over here. Right, that piece has no solution. Because the least a sine value could ever be is minus 1. The greatest the sine value could ever be is positive 1. So there's no way to get down to negative 4. All right, so there are all solutions. And this one didn't have, this one just uh, didn't say to find the restricted solution set, but let's put it up there anyway. So if we're going 0 to 2 pi, the solutions are pretty easy to identify because we're looking right at them. They are the representative solutions above. We have pi over 6 or 5 pi over 6. Those are the only two if we're going to look at the restricted solutions. Pi over 6 or 5 pi over 6. All right. This one. So 2 tangent squared. Again, everything to one side and factor. Everything to one side and factor. Our goal is to get to the zero product rule. So when we write down our pairs of parentheses, this is where we start. We know that much. Right off the bat, we know that much. Now this is a lot easier, actually, than the last one. The last one, you had choices. 1 and 4, 2 and 2. This one, that 7's prime. So you can only use a 7 and a 1. And putting the 7 over here where it's going to pair with the 2 and make a 14, that seems unlikely. So if it factors, it's going to have to be that. And does that work? <coughs> Sad face. So definitely does not factor. Does not factor. So what do you do? Quadratic formula. Good. Yippee, the quadratic formula. Yay. So we look at this quadratic above, and we identify A, B, and C. Right, there's your A, there's your B, there's your C. And for the quadratic formula, Normally, your variable is x. You're saying, oh, x is equal to negative b, plus or minus, blah, blah, blah. But our variable is not x. Our variable is tangent x. So we have to do it a little differently. So instead of x on the left, it's tangent x on the left. 
negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times ac over 2a. So there's our quadratic formula. All right, doozy. So let's get the right side. Well, we'll do one more step here, and then we'll do some calculator stuff. All right, so that's going to be 56 plus 9, so 65. So let's get two possibilities here. So we're going to have 3 plus the square root of 65 in parentheses. Make sure you wrap that numerator. 3 plus root 65 divided by 9. That's going to be, let's go to two decimals. 1.23, uh, yeah, 1.23. I said 1.323. Ah. Or, and then we'll do the subtraction one. 3 minus, and we get minus 0.56 the two decimal places. <coughs> All right. Unit circle. Let's leave this one big. This, this, we're going to need some help here. All right. Tangent is 1.23. Yeah? How do you get the 9? Yeah. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> What should that be? Four. A four. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> yeah. In math, we call that a typo. Yeah, that was definitely, yeah, that's four. I better redo these because I had a nine in there. All right, so minus 1.27 or... 2.77. Yeah, thanks for telling me that before I do the next step. All right, 2.77, what quadrants are we in? Positive tangent. One and three. So for that one, 2.77, kind of steep. Slope's almost three. That's that one. That's that one. And then the other one, negative 1.27. So negative 1 is right there. It's a little steeper than negative 1, so let's do that for those two. Okay, so. For the blue group in quadrant 1, we need that angle right there. So we have tangent of x equals 2.77. This is convenient because the reference angle and the angle are the same in quadrant one. So when we type in inverse tangent of 2.77, we're good to go. Now, we need to know what, uh, it didn't say to use degrees or radians. I'm going to switch to degrees on the test when we have to use our calculator. I would much rather you do it in degrees because then you can kind of see if you're in the right quadrant. With radians, it's harder to tell. So I'm going to switch to degree mode. And I'm going to type in inverse tangent of 2.77. And we get 70 degrees. I'm going to just round to the nearest degree, 70 degrees. Okay. So that gives us the one and three solutions. So from that, we can get all of these. It's 70 plus 180K. All right, now let's do the red group, and then we'll make our conclusion. So tan x equals negative 1.27. All right, we have to use a reference angle. So we go x prime equals inverse tan of absolute value of negative 1.27. A reference angle is always positive. It's always acute. And the way we ensure that is by taking the absolute value. So inverse tan of positive 1.27. That gives us 50 
1.8. I'm just going to round. Let's just keep this simple. It's, we don't need decimals. There's too many other crazy things happening in this problem. Okay. That reference angle for the red group is right there. Right. So that's, that's x prime for the red group of solutions. And how do we get the red x then from the red x prime? 180 minus 52. Because we're in quadrant 2, so 180 minus 52 is 128 degrees. So that is the red representative angle in quadrant 2. So our final answer for over there, we will say that x is equal to 70 degrees plus 180k or 128 plus 180k. So that's our group of all answers. If we wanted just 0 to 360, we'll do it in degrees, we can pick them off. The blue is 70, the red is 128, then we're back to blue, which is 180 plus 70, which is 250. Then we're back to red, which is 128 plus 180, which is 2308, I believe. And that would be our restricted group. Right, so that's a hard one. <laughs> nice expression. All right, any questions on any of the steps with that hard one? Yeah? On the test, how little do you want us to round? I'll tell you. I'll usually keep it going out to lots of decimal places. is just extra busy, confusing work. So usually with degrees, I'll say round to the nearest degree. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely tell you, though, so you're not doing a whole bunch of busy work. All right. Let's continue. So, reference angles, they're angles, we just did a couple, and now you're going to try. So, reference angle is the acute angle between the terminal ray and the x-axis. So, I will draw the picture here, and then you are going to solve it. So, cosine is negative two-thirds. We have two possible answers here. There and there. All right. Ready? Go. Special. It's not a special one, so you're going to have to use calculator. <laughs> how how do we find theta prime? Yeah, inverse cosine of the absolute value. And what do we get to the nearest degree? 
Once again? 48. 48, thank you. 48 degrees. So the two groups of solutions that we have are in quadrants two and three. So we need to know, and they both have the same reference angle. So that reference angle, I'm going to squeeze it in. It's going to be there for the quadrant two group, and it's going to be there for the quadrant three group. So we have to use that reference angle of 48 to get the red solutions and the blue solutions up there. I wish I'd done this in green. Can I change it to green on the fly? Oh, cool. All right. So our red group up in quadrant two, what do we do with the 48 to get the theta there? 180 minus it, so 132 <coughs> plus 360k to jump all the way around the circle. Or to get to the blue group there, that reference angle, what do we do with that? So if that's 48, we add, add it to 180. So it's going to be, so we're going to add 48 to 180, get 228 plus 360k. That will get us all the way around. So this will be our group of all solutions. <coughs> and if we wanted just 0 to 360, just those two, right? We're just doing it. If we wanted just 0 to 360, we'd have 132 and 228. All right, so now try that one. Sine of theta is negative one fourth. This Pretty clear on how to find the reference angle. We're just going to always do the inverse trig function of the <coughs> absolute value of the ratio. And it, we'll do it in degrees. Anytime we have to go to our calculator to find these angles, I will ask you to do it in degrees. Because then you can kind of look. Oh, 48 degrees, I can see it there. I can sub subtract that from 180 or add it to 180 easily. If you're adding or subtracting from pi, it's kind of a little bit of a headache and there's enough going on. So on the test, I'll definitely keep it in degrees for these ones that aren't special. So we're going to do the inverse sine of the absolute value of one of negative one fourth. And 14 degrees if we round the nearest degree. 14 degrees. All right, so that tells us that our blue group is going to be 180 plus 14, so 194 plus 360K. That'll be our blue group, 194 plus 360K. How about the red group over there in quadrant four? How much? Yeah, so we take 360 and subtract 14 and get 346, good plus 360k. All right, so there are all solutions. And for this one, again, it's pretty easy. If we wanted to just get the two solutions between 0 and 360, they would be that one and that one, if it was between 0 and 360. All right. Good. You guys are doing great. All right, time for creativity. All right, let's start with 
Um, I have to, like, somehow my notes got split. Because what we want to do now is solve something called a, no, I can just draw it the board, it's easy enough. What we want to do now is solve something called multiple angle equations. Do I definitely have, oh, I have them in a separate file. Darn it. That's okay. We can be creative easily. So multiple angle equations, that's our last step in this chapter. <coughs> So, first example. Let's suppose we have sine of 3 theta equals negative root 3 over 2. <coughs> so instead of an angle of just theta, we've got a multiple angle. And these are tricky. If you aren't careful, but I'll try to explain it so clearly that it will work. <coughs> I'll try. Okay, so we have sine of an angle. The angle is a triple angle. Let's just think of it as sine of an angle for the minute. So, for the moment. So sine of angle is negative root 3 over 2. So we're going to jump to our unit circle and we're going to do what we normally do. We want the sine value to be negative root 3 over 2, so we would be down there. Okay. So here's the part that's different. <clears throat> when we look at our two groups of solutions, we will say the following. Instead of theta equals 1, 2, 3, 4 pi over 3, we have to say 3 theta is equal to 4 pi over 3 plus 2 pi times k. So that's our group three solutions for three theta. So that part's kind of like the other part. That's not too bad. But then we have to remember that we're trying to solve for theta. So what do we do to solve for theta? Divide by three. Here's the hard part. So when we divide by three, we have to divide each term by three. Those solutions are no longer in quadrant 3. Right. 3 theta is in quadrant 3, but theta, when we divide by the 3, they're somewhere else, somewhere up here. We could figure out where. It doesn't really matter. But they're not in quadrant 3 anymore. Okay, So those are our thetas that we generated from quadrant 3 work. <clears throat> then we also have our red group, our quadrant 4 stuff. Or 3 theta, not just theta, 3 theta now, <coughs> is equal to 5 pi over 3 plus 2 pi k. Plus 2 pi k. <coughs> now the hard part, divide by 3. So that's 5 pi over 9. And do not forget to divide the counter by 3 also. <coughs> So this would be the group of all solutions. All solutions would be that. But just keep in mind, we're not looking at the solutions anymore. Like with all the other ones where we just had one theta or one x, those were the solutions. That's not, those aren't the solutions here because we had to divide by 3. So now, here is the hardest part of all. If we want the solutions between 0 and 2 pi, here, it's a little more complicated than here. How many solutions between 0 and 2 pi do we have here? Two. Here, we had two. When we look here, we, there's not two. If that angle is multiple, if the angle theta is multiplied by 3, we took that answer and divided it by 3. So there are going to be 3 answers between 0 and 2 pi for each of these smiley faces. So we're going to have 6 answers total. So if we see 2 answers here, 
and we have a 3 theta, we're going to end up having 3 times 2, or 6 answers total. So this is the trickier part. So our solutions would be 4 pi over 9. But then we have to add 2 pi over 3 twice. If I wanted to rewrite this so the denominator is 9, which I would recommend doing, we'd have 6 pi over 9. Right, those are the same. 2 pi over 3, 6 pi over 9. So we're going to be adding 6 to the numerator twice. So that will give us 10 pi over 9 and 16 pi over 9. So those three from the blues. And then we're going to have three from the reds. 5 pi over 9. We have to add 6 to the numerator, so that's going to be 11 pi over 9. Add 6 again, we get 17 pi over 9. And that's it. If we added 6 again, we would get 23 pi over 9. 23 pi over 9 is more than 2 pi. 23 pi over 9 is more than 2 pi because 2 pi is 18 pi over 9. So we've gone too far. So you can always make sure that you're between 0 and 2 pi by actually, you know, if you go 1 beyond, you'll see that, oh, that's more than 2 pi. All right. So that's, those are harder. Let's try another one. So let's suppose we have cosine of 4 theta equals negative 1 half. Cosine of 4 theta is negative 1 half. Okay. Draw a picture. We see two places on the unit circle where cosine is negative 1 half. We have there and we have there. So we'll talk about our blue group. We'll put them in quadrant 3. We'll put our red group in quadrant 2. And again, we have to be super careful right from the start. Those two smiley faces are representing 4 theta, not theta. So it's 4 theta. That's equal to 2 pi over 3 plus 2 pi k. And the red group will be 4 theta equals 4 pi over 3 plus 2 pi k. And to solve for theta, to get all solutions, what do we do to both sides? Divide by 4. Right? And that will give us all solutions for theta. So theta will be 2 pi divided by, oh, that, there's a little simplification there. I'll do that in the next step, simplify that. So make sure the biggest mistake right there is to not divide the counterpart. Make sure you divide the counterpart. So we'll end up with pi over 6 plus pi over 2k, or pi over 3 plus pi over 2k. So there's our group of all solutions. So that's all. And if we wanted just 0 to 2 pi, Hmm, how many should we have? We see 2, but we multiplied the angle by 4. So we're going to have 4 for each, so we'll have an 8 total. Mm -hmm. So well, 4 from each, 8 total. So our blue answers, hmm, I've got to add two fractions here. The denominators need to match. So I'm going to multiply top and bottom of that by 3. So I have 3 pi over 6. 3 pi over 6 is going to be an easier way to add these. 3 pi over 6. So I'm going to add 3 to the numerator repeatedly, 3 times. So we'll have pi over 6. And then we have to add 3 pi over 6. So that's 4 pi over 6. And we have to add 3 pi over 6. So that's 7 pi over 6. 10 pi over 6. And those should be commas. Not addition symbols, commas. All right, so there are our blue group. And then our green, uh, red group, pi over 3. Same thing, we have to add 3's to the numerator. We have to add 3 pi over 6 to that. So that's 
Oh, we're going to get some repeats, aren't we? So we're going to get pi over 3. Oh, no, no. I said that incorrectly. The, these we have to add set differently. We would have to make this 2 pi over 6. We can't just add 3s to the numerator because the denominators are different here. So we have to make that 2 pi over 6 and then add 3 pi over 6 to that. Yeah, we shouldn't be getting repeats. Repeats should be a clue that something's wrong. So then we get 5 pi over 6. Um, and then we get 8 pi over 6, which reduces to 4 pi over 3. And then we get 11 pi over 6. So those would be our 8. And it may be easier not to reduce right away, but if you do reduce, the, that's what you'll get. Can you reduce the blue ones as well? Yes. Oh, I didn't reduce the blue ones, did I? Yeah, yeah we should reduce those. We will reduce them all for the end, absolutely. So this should be reduced to 2 pi over 3. Thanks, I didn't even notice that. I was 2 pi over 3 and 5 pi over 3. Yeah, okay. yeah we should definitely reduce those. I was consumed with the fact that I put pluses instead of commas. And <laughs> yeah, so those would be our reduced ones. We would reduce that down, reduce that down. All right, you get the idea? All right, now you try this one. I'll give you less than eight solutions. <laughs> so let's, you guys do cosine of 2 theta is equal to, let's do um, minus 1. Cosine of 2 theta is equal to minus 1. circle, cosine is negative 1 on the left edge. That's where we should start. Circle with the left edge. That's where cosine is equal to minus 1. That's what your picture should look like. You have one terminal point only on the unit circle. So we would say that 2 theta is equal to pi plus, what's our counter? 2 pi k will get us all the way around again. 2 pi k. And then, what does this tell us about theta? Divide by 2, all the way across. So we get pi over 2 plus 2k. All right, pi cancels there. Oh, no. I'm dividing by 2, not pi. Uh-oh, getting sloppy. Dividing by 2, the 2 cancels. All right, so this is all solutions right here. These are all the thetas that satisfy that equation. <coughs> and if we want 0 to 2 pi, Certainly pi over 2 is 1. And then what's the next one? So we add pi to that. We get 3 pi over 2. And do we keep on going? Done. If we add pi to that, we're going to be beyond. We're going to be at 5 pi over 2. So we'll be beyond 2 pi. And so the clue that I've been trying to emphasize is that if we see one solution, we multiply by that coefficient of the angle, and that's how many we'll end up with at the very end. One over two. Okay. 
So I want to really emphasize one thing. Unless, does anyone have a question on, on that? I want to emphasize something that is really, really important to understand. I want to look at this versus this. <clears throat> the thing on the left is an equation. How many solutions does it have? Infinite solutions. <clears throat> The thing on the right is an expression. Right, that's not an equation. That's just an expression. How many quote unquote answers does it have? One. This thing is a function. <coughs> this has one solution here. One only. Inverse sine of one half does not mean all angles that have a sine value of one half. Inverse sine of one half means the angle on the right side of the circle with a sine value of one half. So there's one answer here. There's one solution only because that's a function and functions have only one solution. So this is a function that we're evaluating. <clears throat> there's going to be one answer to that evaluation. So really, really important to understand the difference. Nowhere up here when I'm solving equations did you ever see me write an inverse trig function unless we had to find a reference angle. That's the only time we ever go to an inverse trig function. So none of these equations do you see any inverse trig functions unless we had to go to a reference angle. <coughs> so those two are totally different. Right? They look very similar, but they're totally different. This is an equation that has infinite solutions. That's an expression that has one answer to it. So it's really important to just get that clear. All right. It's weekend time almost. <clears throat> Test next Thursday. Review on Tuesday. Tutoring tomorrow. Tutoring tomorrow. Twelve at one. At one or at two? Twelve. 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 Twelve.